synonymous with the famous old capital of the great Ahilyabai Holkar, a queen who played a pivotal role in 18th century India, is the weave that is closely connected with her. Named after her capital, the famous Maheshwari represents the times it was born in. With the coolness of cotton, the luster of silk and the lightness ideal for the hot Indian summers on the Malwa Plateau, its roots lie in the Maratha heartland from where an empire was born. Almost wiped out four decades ago, the Maheshwari Sari also tells the story of an amazing revival. Baji Rao I, made famous by a recent blockbuster movie, was the architect of an audacious and ambitious expansionary policy that saw the Peshwas of Pune dominate a large part of India in the 18th century. This stretch of the Narmada River at Raver Khedi is historic as it is from this very spot, the shallowest part of the river, that the Maratha armies crossed the Narmada to begin their conquest across the north in 1723 CE. As the empire spread, the Peshwa put his loyal generals in charge of large territories. The Malwa Plateau was carved out between the Sindhyas, the Holkars and the Pavars, with the largest share going to Subedar Malhar Rao Holkar. This marked the beginning of the Holkar Kingdom, which would see its golden age under his daughter-in-law, Ahilyabai. Within a span of 50 years, the Maratha Empire spread from Punjab to Tanjavur in present-day Tamil Nadu, with its armies planting the Peshwa flag in Atak near Peshawar. The Marathas quickly slipped into the vacuum left by the collapsing Mughal Empire to carve a niche for themselves. If Bajira was the architect of the Maratha expansion towards the second half of the 18th century, it was Ahilyabai Holkar who emerged as the most powerful ruler in the Malwa region. The evidence of her clout can be seen all the way in Banaras, where she commissioned the rebuilding of the famed Kashi Vishwanath temple. With the rise of the Maratha Empire came the traders and the rich fabrics from the north. These would pass through Raver Khed down south to the Peshwa capital of Pune. You can still see the ruins of a toll booth here in Raver Khed which the Peshwas built to collect revenue from the merchants. The Maratha Empire would reach its zenith under Bajirao's son and successor, Peshwa Balaji Bajirao, more popularly known as Nana Sahib. The immense wealth from the Maratha campaigns in the north and the south made Pune one of the richest cities in India. New pates or settlements were built, giving incentives to traders, merchants and artisans to settle down in the city. At the SNDT University, Mumbai, we spoke to the head of the history department, Dr. Varsha Shirgaonkar, author of a book on the cultural history of the Peshwas. Dr. Shirgaonkar explained how Pune, the Peshwa capital, became so famous for its saris and weaves. Initially, to cater to the needs of people, they were imported. But imported in the sense, by that time, already Devgiri was under the Peshwa rule. So it was just the fabric being brought from Devgiri to Pune because weavers were in Devgiri only, in Python. The weavers were in Python. And before the entire setup of handloom and all could be established in Pune, it was best to bring that cloth. But uh, once when the demand started increasing, because uh, from the time of uh, say Nana Fadnes, that is Savai Madhara Peshwa and all that, Pune became a very, very important uh, center of uh, population shifting, migration also, because they started getting jobs also. And naturally, uh, they decided to set up handlooms even there. So similar kind of silks could be produced here. And once when uh, that manufacturing, uh, manufactured product, textile product was from Pune, then it did not have the name as Paitani or so. Then naturally, yeah. we have the local name, Sonara and Pet. This was the beginning of what would later be called the Puneri Sari. Even today, go to Theyur 
and you will see power looms like this make these saris in large numbers. Since it catered to the general public, the Puneri was and is still an easily affordable sari made of simple cotton. Historians point that as Pune emerged as a commercial hub, weavers came from far and wide. Python and even the Andhra belt from centres like Mangalagiri, well known for its famous cotton weaves. Even though uh, Nizam and the Peshwa, they had uh, politically uh, not very, very good relations because they were competitors of each other with regards to Krishna Tungabhadra Tunga Doa. Yet culturally, we have lot of give and take. So many artisans coming from there, coming here and uh, the artisans going from the Peshwa period to the south. This exchange of artisans resulted in a rich cultural synthesis in the weaves. Saili Palandi Datar, a research scholar and an expert on the history of Pune, reveals how the city eventually became a retail hub for textiles from all over India. In those days, the textile did not come from a, from a, a particular area. Uh, we see that uh, silk is generally coming from north or down south. Uh, from Ganga Khora, so it is called Ganga Khori. We have uh, Maheshwar and Chanderi giving, uh, providing the, uh, the fabrics in the, those areas. We have Surat people bringing in a lot of cotton. Uh, even uh, Maratha belt, Marathwada belt is giving a lot of cotton and mix of cotton and silk, which is called Garba Reshmi, which is one of the most favorite of all the royal ladies. Uh, we see very uh, new sort of material like velvet and satins coming from Mumbai because of the British influences. So all those have been used for particular type of garment, even for the soldiers, because government, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a tradition that you give a ghoda or a horse to the uh, bargir and you are supposed to give two sets of uniforms. So those uniforms were made from coarse sort of cotton, which was coming from Nanded, Saswad and nearby areas. So uh, all that uh, found a market in Pune, which was the biggest market of that time. And that's why we see that uh, Pune developed essentially as a retail market. However, the lack of local production of silk or cotton meant that Pune could never really take off as a textile production center. And so didn't survive the fall of the Peshwas in 1818, as with it, they lost patronage. However, while the handloom weaves of Pune no longer survive, what we have are the lush weaves of Maheshwar, a town once described by Maratha minister Nana Fadnavis as a threshold of Pune. And it was all thanks to this great queen, Ahilyabai Holkar. Ahilyabai succeeded to the throne after the death of her father-in-law, Malhar Rao Holkar, in 1766. Originally based out of Indore, Ahilya Bai Holkar shifted her capital to Maheshwar soon after taking over. The 29-year rule of Ahilya Bai saw Maheshwar emerge as a prosperous and rich kingdom. Suganda Johar, one of the foremost experts in the history of Maheshwar, explains how at the heart of Ahilya Bai's success was her smart financial decisions. During her reign, Ahilya Bai increased the revenues of her kingdom 130% without any increase in her territories. Interestingly, long before anyone else attempted it, Ahilyabai set Maheshwar as a kind of special economic zone where traders and bankers from across the Malwa region were given tax exemptions and privileges to settle and establish business ventures. It worked and clearly Ahilyabai was well ahead of her times. At Maheshwar, she, I find that she tried to do a lot of different things to increase the economic and prosperity. Around Maheshwar, you have a number of agriculturists who tell you of how they are Gujaratis. They are not from Madhya Pradesh. They tell you how they were invited by Ahilya Bhai to come down and till this land because there was no one here. So, so that increased it. The second thing uh, that she did is she started, uh, experimented and worked and created this unique weave called the Maheshwari Sari. 
I went and interviewed the weavers and asked them about where do th you come from, what is your history. And I came across something very, very interesting. First and foremost, many of these weavers told me that their ancestors were brought from Mandro. And the second and even more important thing is they belong to a special caste who believe that their perceptor was Kirat Arjun, the famous king from Maheshwar. The Maheshwari Sari, so popular today, is perhaps one of India's youngest weaves. It was entirely Ahilya Bai Holkar's creation. She brought in weavers from Mandu, which was the old capital of Malwa, and gave them incentives, appointed special officers so that they could get a steady supply of cotton and silk, and encouraged experimentation. The most famous variety of the Maheshwari, for instance, is the famous Garb Reshmi Sari, a combination of silk and cotton woven in a special weave. The rich looking yet light fabric was a big hit with the Maratha women. Over time, even these traditional Navwari or nine yard saris with traditional Maharashtrian borders would become famous as Maheshwari saris. Suganda Johar feels that Ahilya Bai Holkar was such a brilliant administrator that her rule would make a fantastic management case study. She says it should be taught in business schools today. The fact that a widow in the middle of the 18th century sits in this godforsaken place and manages to build up over in a hundred different places across the length and breadth of India, right from Uttarkashi to Rameshwar and from Gaya to so uh, Somnath, including the current Banaras thing, is all built by her. And she did not just send the money. She had the architects, they drew up the drawings, she approved the drawings, she approved the builders, asked, called for the builders, sent them, she approved, found the project managers, found the best way of discounting money. She was so smart, I told you she was tight-fisted. She knew that if she, when discounting money and giving money to the bankers, if she used coinage which was minted in Maheshwar, which was purer, she got a better deal for the same Holkar Shai things, uh, rupiah, than if she used from the Chandwar mint. So she never used the Chandwar mint, she only used that mint. So she, she knew her money and she was constantly in, uh, we have letters, excellent letters, constantly keeping in touch, okay, where have you been? What is your problem? Why haven't you done this? We found this somewhere else. That sort of real control. To me, she is she should be one of the most important management case studies that Indians can conduct but then we only look west <laughs> after Ahilya death in 1795 however Maheshwar went into decline the Holkar capital was first shifted to Bhanpura in Mansour district of Madhya Pradesh and then finally to Indore in 1818 it is Indore which is famous today rather than Maheshwar. And while Indore has become a large commercial hub today, Maheshwar continues to be a small town with just memories of its old glory days. With the fall of Maheshwar, its textiles too went into decline. The biggest patrons of the Maheshwari saris were the royal and noble families from India. After independence, the patronage died out and the weavers fell on hard times. With a lack of patronage, the quality of the saris also dropped drastically. A large number of weavers from Maheshwar migrated to places like Bhivandi near Mumbai, where there were power looms. In fact, few realize that it is the out-of-work weavers after the fall of Peshwai Pune who migrated to Mumbai in large numbers as the British set up their cotton mills here. Eventually, as large textile mills were set up, Traditional weavers took up work there, laying the foundation of the modern Indian textile industry in Bombay. It always happens when the patronage is lost, the artisans and the artists, they become helter-skelter and they try to seek the new masters. So we have got uh, information that many of them started shifting to Bombay. And uh, in Bombay, then from 19th century, we have got the commercial class, the Parsis coming up, 
the textile mills being set up. So, you know, the whole scenario changes, but it doesn't become overnight. It happens over the period of about 50 years, 100 years. Almost wiped out between the 1950s and 70s, the Maheshwari is today seen as a successful revival story thanks to the efforts over the last four decades. This is the Maheshwari weaving center within the Maheshwar fort started by the Reva Society set up by Ahilya Bai's descendant Richard Holkar and Sally Holkar. The society was set up in 1978 to revive the Maheshwari and also provide a means of local employment. Initially supported by the likes of noted handloom revivalists like Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Reva has come a long way. Richard Holkar explains how it all started. Leela Mulgaonkar, she was um, the wife of Suman Mulgaonkar, who was the head of Telco. She was at that time head of the Central Social Welfare Board. Uh, and she said, look, she is Maharashtra. Uh, so she said, look here, uh, why don't we put together an NGO? Uh, the Central Social Welfare Board will fund it. Our requirement is that you concentrate on giving employment to women. Uh, so, oh, fine, excellent idea. So she gave us 86,000 rupees in 1900, I think in 77 or 78, around about that time. Uh, and we started off. And it was very difficult to get the weave, women to weave because the weaving had been done, the system of weaving in Maheshwar and in many parts of India, I'm sure it's the same, but basically the weaver is the guy. He's the weaver. Money is given, who's it given to? The guy. Now, guys being guys, half the time they spend in the bazaar with their chums and half the time they're weaving. When they're not weaving, their wife is weaving. So, readily skilled labor force, but no economic power and not enough money going to the home. Not enough money going to the home. So, that was the objective of Leela Mulgankar. She said, we want to empower women, we want to have more incoming into the family itself, so that the family can rise. The Reva Society began with eight women weavers in 1978. The idea was to get local women well trained in their household looms to come and work with facilities. Richard Holker tells us that the idea was not just to revive the Maheshwari, but also make it relevant to changing tastes and styles. This was not always easy. The traditional skills and traditional craftspeople uh, are risk averse. They don't have bank accounts and savings accounts. If they have a bad year, a bad month or whatnot, they can fall back on it. They basically live almost hand to mouth. In any case, what they weave, they sell, but their cell comes into the home and it supports the household and so forth. Um, so, um, they had been weaving the same thing, but no success did they have, you know. Nonetheless, it was very difficult for them to get onto our idea. And our idea, uh, my idea is just me and all these other uh, well-wishers, uh, was to make of the Maheshwari sari, at that time it was only saris being woven, a fashion statement. It took four to five years before they could understand, and we could also understand, that the market tastes change, the colors change, the borders change. Uh, if you don't keep up with this, then you're nowhere. The work done by the Veva Society between 1980 and 2000 was instrumental in transforming the weaving community in Maheshwar. From a fast dwindling community of 250 weavers, today there are more than 2,000 weavers in Maheshwar town. From saris, Reva Society has diversified into dupattas, shawls, tools and dress materials made from the Maheshwari fabric which is extremely popular. To cater to the increasing demand, Reva employs around 70 weavers and they produce over 2,000 saris, 4,000 pieces of dupatta, shawls and stoles and 7,000 meters of dress material in a year. Sold through their distribution network across major cities in India, the price of the Maheshwari sari ranges from 4,000 rupees and above depending on the fabric and the intricacy of the design. The growing number of weavers at a time when so many are shutting their looms across India 
is a testimony to the success of the revival of the Maheshwari. Richard Holker believes that the lessons learned from the work done here are relevant elsewhere across India. The only way that it can move forward as a niche product is in continually doing uh, interesting things which cannot easily be done either in the power loom or in the mill. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the mixture, purpose made mixture of weaving and printing, weaving and embroidery uh, or ornamentation of whatever sort you want is something which the handloom can do. The revival of the Maheshwari has also rejuvenated Maheshwar, Ahilyabai's old capital. And the growing prosperity of the weavers here is evident. They have not just adapted to changing tastes, they are today also embracing change. 34-year-old Yashwant Holkar represents the young generation holding a torch to an old legacy. He says there is a lot that he has learned from Ahilyabai, who has been a great influence in his life. For me personally, uh, Ahilyabai stands for principles. Principles of integrity, equality, uh, humility. Uh, she stands for a universal approach towards bettering society. Um, and, and we see that in the works that she did, not only in her own state, uh, but across India. Um, we see that in how she managed her court to, to include um, views and, and um, perspectives from across cultures, across religions, across castes. So, um, you know, her role for me um, and what I see more and more people gravitating towards is an example of um, what India can be in a progressive manner but holding on to fundamental values. Um, and we see that in Maheshwar. The DNA of Maheshwar has remained intact, you know. Um, Maheshwar is a very spiritual place, um, and yet at the same time a very secular place. All cultures have come together, um, caste, creed, religion, all intermingle in Maheshwar, primarily because uh, weaving has given them a chance to interact on a day-to-day -day basis. It's created that social fabric. Today, Ahilyabai Holkar statues dot towns and cities across India. It can even be seen in the country's parliament. There are airports, universities and public institutions named after her. And it is only apt that this weave, which is her legacy, is thriving because it has adapted to the changing tastes of a new India.